the 30 seconds I have with you. So tonight we've, we've picked up our, our, our leads from our department from all sorts of different areas um, to talk to you about what we are changing, what we're looking for for the future, because change has to happen to residencies. It has to keep growing. It can't just be stuck in our laurels of where we're at. You know, the patient care is the same, but how we approach you has to be different. And so what I want to do tonight is let you all just get a chance for probably less than five minutes for each subject. Anytime you have a question, please interrupt us. Don't be stuck in the Zoom hole where you're sitting there like we all do staring at each other and wondering if it's impolite. We'd much rather this be a conversation. So if we say something that seems interesting, cool, or crazy, call us on it, ask us. Let us answer the questions for you and try to be, um, you know, because this is, this is for you to help figure out where you want to go. As I told you during interview, your interview process, I want you to end up in the right place. And if that is us, that's wonderful. And if it's if you're at another, if you have to see this today or, or you already decide you want to go somewhere else, that is also equally okay. I want you to figure out the right spot for yourself. So we're going to tell you the truth about it. And otherwise, I'm going to be, sh I'll shut up now and let Adam start running. Adam's going to run our show as to what we're doing, as to who's going first and who's uh, what we're talking about. Now, I know, hi, I'm Adam Kellogg. I'm one of the associate program directors uh, and the designated short straw Zoom uh, runner for our, uh, all of our stuff here at Bay State. So I know Ben invited you to interrupt and I, we run our conferences and I know that a lot of you aren't gonna do it. Um, that's okay. We really do welcome you to jump in if you have questions, but you can also throw them into the chat and we'll make sure we will either answer them directly in the chat if it's easily answerable and if it's something that we want to kind of put out back out to the whole group. We'll also, there's going to be time for sort of a more open Q&A at the end. This shouldn't take long. We just want to run through some kind of highlights that we see coming in the program. So without any more babbling, um, I want to hand it over to Zach Testo and Rachel Gershaw, who are uh, kind of our wellness champion to talk a little bit about that aspect of our culture. Hi, everybody. Um, for those of you who had never seen me before at any of the game nights or whatever, I'm Zach Testo. I'm the <clears throat> wellness fellowship director and the wellness director for the emergency department. And my first fellow this year is Dr. Rachel Gershaw, who's here with me as well. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, when we talk about where we're going um, as far as wellness goes at Bay State, I think we've always had a uh, resident wellness mentality, and that involves a lot of uh, emotional support, a lot of uh, community building, and a lot of um, thought given to how to make a residency start to feel like, you know, the platitude is always like a family, but like a group of people that you can trust. When we start to think of how we can go outside of that and where we're going, um, it's coming down to um, COVID revealing a lot of um, areas where mental health is going to be absolutely imperative. So, uh, where Bay State is going is a huge mental health outreach program, um, hopefully some ways to be able to tackle that um, from multiple different angles, which I'm going to let Rachel talk about. And then um, really about finding a sense of having a administration and a team that you really feel like they have your back, that they feel like they are invested in your ability to continue to do your job, even though we are inherently in a job that does beat us down in a lot of different ways. So um, having people who are vocal about um, taking time for yourself, that work-life balance is classic, but also people who are uh, vocal and committed to change within the hospital to be able to protect people from um, you know, the uh, emotional toll that it really does take. So a couple of initiatives that I did wanna highlight, I'm gonna toss it over to Rachel to um, go through a couple of those. Hey guys, does anyone have any questions before I start off? Adam, let me know if anyone does. <laughs> so I'm Rachel, nice to meet you guys. I was also a resident here um, and stayed on for this wellness fellowship. So that just goes to show um, something that our department really invests in wellness in general so much that they let me do a fellowship in it. Um, which is awesome. And if you guys have unique interests as well, um, there's always different fellowships in the making. And I know you're going to learn a lot about that tonight. Um, a couple of things that I did want to touch base on, um, sort of the highlight of my residency experience here. And one of the things we're revamping is our wellness and resiliency club. Um, so that happens one Thursday a month at Journaly and attending, um, attendings house. Um, and the whole entire residency is off and we all get to be together. Um, and part of that is to grow as a group together, but also to have really difficult um, conversations and things that you don't necessarily learn um, in the clinical scenario. So just some highlight topics 
um, our learning about disability insurance, life insurance, um, sort of the financial aspects of becoming a real doctor, um, and then also how to deal with your difficult consultants, how to break bad news, and things that sort of you need to talk about in a different um, in a different setting. So we're always sort of revamping that curriculum. Um, and that was definitely one of the highlights of being a resident here and something we're continuing to grow um, over the course of the year. So there'll be some exciting changes coming up next year with that. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about our peer support program. So most of the time, I think when you go under a traumatic, or sorry, when you experience a traumatic event um, in the workplace, you end up going to a colleague, um, an attending or a peer. Um, and so we've worked hard on this peer support program and a lot of the emergency department is, um, or sorry, a few people from the emergency department have been trained to become peer supporters. Um, and I think this is a really cool program that's starting to expand and grow um, because most of the time we do wanna reach out to someone and this is a confidential system um, and you get essentially triaged to your own peer supporter and you get to just talk about your experience um, and they can either point you in the right direction or just be sort of like an ear to, li uh, to listen in a time of need. So um, this is just a really cool um, program and something that I think over the next year is really gonna expand as well. Um, and then the third thing I wanted to talk about is um, in our fellowship, we sort of get to choose our own track. Um, so I chose to work on a coaching program. Um, so I underwent a, a training program myself to become a coach uh, for change. Um, so I really wanted to have the residents and the attendings and all the providers who want to sign up um, really just work on something for themselves um, to make themselves better and feel um, a little bit prouder about the work they do both inside and outside of the hospital. So the the purpose of that is really to just show that just making a slight little adjustment um, can make a big change in your life. Um, and I think those are the three things I wanted to highlight tonight, but there's always some really cool stuff going on in the wellness department. So I'm happy to answer, answer any more questions about that. Um, but there's definitely a big emphasis on the, in this residency in general. So um, you guys will be well taken care of here. <laughs> For anyone who can't see the chat, I do want to throw the question uh, that Jordan put in there to Zach. Zach, how do you feel about more than one fellow per year? Does that give you like the cold sweats? No, absolutely not. Um, I welcome more fellows. I think this is one of those unique uh, fellowships where multiple voices, multiple a uh, aspects of personalities and backgrounds really does wonders for being able to foster the environment because everybody does have a very unique resi uh, residency experience, a unique medicine experience. And if I were to go wide with it, my ideal would be to be able to facilitate many fellowships from other places in the hospital like medicine and surgery to be able to have their perspective so we can come up with some more unified things. So great question, Jordan, uh, no cap as of right now. I cannot wait to meet your first surgical wellness fellow. That's gonna be awesome. Um, and I, as gonna, they're going to have to be previously having done maybe EM and then they moved into it because they got they just wanted to do more things. But um, I appreciate anybody who would be willing to do that. And then Ben responded in the chat as well that that's pretty much all of our fellowships flex each year to accommodate what the interests of the folks who want to do them. There's not a set number that each one is locked into. All right, I think next up is going to be uh, CN Lutfi Clayton, our other associate program director, who's going to talk about airway training and toys because she has all the best toys. Do you mind if I ask a question real quick about wellness? Um, Absolutely. I was wondering, um, with this year being so challenging, I'm sure you guys uh, implemented some changes for wellness. I was wondering which ones that are that were initially temporary changes are kind of now being considered for uh, as permanent changes? Like what things uh, do you guys um, learn about wellness that you might you guys might keep in the program? Um, yeah, so I can talk a little bit about that. Um, when, we when we look back at the um, trauma that took place with um, like the SARS, uh, the initial SARS in China and H1N1 in certain parts of the world, the, sh the focus shifted onto mental health as well as um, really focusing on PTSD because we really have yet to see the effects of this. So the, the change and the shift of our hospital getting an uh, employee assistance program that was gonna be solid, uh, virtual and totally accessible at all times 
is something that's going to stick. And I think that was the most essential part of this was it was a paradigm shift of mental health because we need to be able to kind of follow that longitudinally. I think that's going to be a really huge thing. One of the things I really like about the employee assistance program that we've started recently is that it's to all our employees. So everyone gets to have a half, a half dozen appointments with a therapist for free. It doesn't matter if you're the house cleaner or if you're the, or if you're the CEO of the hospital. That was something that they changed recently. So every single person is taken care of because it's not just the physicians that, that run into trouble. It's all of us that do. So that was something that the hospital started in the last, in the last year and a half that uh, I thought was phenomenal. Before we move on to CN, I do want to give uh, Zach a chance to answer uh, Catherine's question about uh, what resilience sort of means to you. And I think you're probably a great person to answer that for us. Yeah, absolutely. And not to cut into CN's time, um, Catherine, I think that's a tremendous question. and It's got so many layers to it. Um, when I think of resilience, I think of a bucket. And I think of um, our job as inevitably going to be poking holes in this bucket. How big the holes get, how much the leak is there um, is very dependent on the person. How big the bucket is to begin with is very dependent on the person. But to be able to keep continuously filling it up is the act of resilience. And what we try to do at Base State is to try to teach people coping mechanisms, um, behaviors, different life approaches in order to maintain a steady flow into the bucket. So when it inevitably comes out, you're not so far below that you don't have anything left for yourself or your patients. So not really a just don't worry about, you know, get a new bucket after residency kind of approach. It's where you're going to learn now how to, how to, you know, during training, how to manage this stuff. You broke right. up a little bit, but yes, whatever you said, absolutely. All right. Well, never mind. I'm just going to go to CN. <laughs> awesome. So uh, my wellness is airway. Uh, and so I'm going to take you through a few of the things that we have been doing in airway lately. Um, most of us probably realize that emergency medicine uh, can be a tough call in terms of a career and finding something you really love, like love enough that you're willing to be dressed up like Ren during conference to argue um, for DL, like that will keep you going through even your toughest years. And so airway is that for me. And we do have a lot of fun with our airway. Um, the, some of the stuff that's been happening this year, um, first off, our fleet of video laryngoscopes have been fornicating in our airway stock room. And they seem to be multiplying every time we go out on the floor. And that's a super wonderful thing because our institution has really supported us. Um, and we have redesigned the airway stock room, thanks to Kristen, who is on this call with me, um, and made it even more functional and easy to use. Speaking of our fleet of tools, um, we have now 11 Glidescopes, three stores CMAX. If you haven't seen CMAX anywhere, they're really awesome. Um, they serve a lot of the same functions as Glidescopes do. They have both standard geometry and um, hyperangulated blades, but they also have fixed blades that are reusable. And so they really feel a lot closer to true DL blades and people end up utilizing them and like really falling in love with them once they actually start trying it out. And so those are our, our big scopes. We have 11 airway carts um, and those airway carts are throughout the department. And the beauty of the carts themselves is that is one of our tools. It actually takes you top to bottom through an airway, really reinforcing your preparation. And so it starts out with pre-oxygenation and it goes all the way through your adjuncts and backups. So you have sort of everything in line in your cart and it makes it really easy in those moments when uh, you need something to actually be able to find it very quickly, but also have a lot of confidence that you know where each item is. And so we have those carts throughout the department and um, they've got little magnets on them. You'll see other pictures of them that tell you where everything is. Um, one of the best parts and my favorite parts that is really recent for us is that we have added, um, rather than using a scope that is getting clean downstairs and taking uh, hours to come back up or that we have to get multiple of them because they're really expensive, we're using disposable scopes now. And so right over here, this is like the glide image of the glide disposable endoscopes that we're using. And the great part about that is it's a learning experience both for the faculty and for our learners. 
and we can use them in a lot of different ways. And right now we are checking tubes with them. We are using them through conduits. We're using them um, as a primary intubation technique. And each of those is just something that you really have to spend some time getting to understand and learn and become comfortable with. But that is one of the fun. Uh, we also have a lot of tricks of the trade. So you will hear me say over and over again, things like bump your stylet and turn to the right, turn to the left. Sometimes there's music added to this. Um, I will teach you the Kiwi twist and your bougies won't uh, flop over on you, all sorts of fun things. And I may even show you videos of myself getting intubated by one of my partners in the OR because it is a great example of how to use a flexible scope to tube someone. So there are really no limits between me and airway and teaching you. In terms of our teaching itself, um, we use a lot of deliberate design. So each of the things that we do in terms of the education for airway, um, we've designed from the ground up to try and reinforce you being a really, really high-end clinician within airway and keeping your patients safe. Um, we have fabulous carts. My husband builds things for me so that we can uh, teach you guys how to do upright intubations. And we record airways and I put them together and we actually go over them in something we call airway tape review. And we physically go through our airways and highlight different themes at any given time. Um, it's one of, from my point of view, like you're not gonna learn airway from me standing up and talking about it. You learn airway by watching it and you learn airway by doing it. And so that's how we actually do this. Um, I will torture you with near packets uh, so that I can actually see the trends. And those trends let me know when people are doing uh, silly things like using Capno for Appox. Um, and those trends also told me that people were using some of our meds uh, on patients that probably weren't the right people to use those meds on. And so now we have a lot more fun. Um, and this was one of the exercises we did where people had to actually come up with um, like the nightmare scenario for any med. So like putting all the contraindications for a medicine together and make like one case that hit on all of them. Uh, and it's just, we try to come up with the most inventive way that gets you the knowledge you need to keep everybody safe. But that's pretty much airway. Uh, it will never stop. I, Ben, you may want to close your ears. Literally got an email today from True Corp. Like, do you have extra money this year? We will sell you more equipment. <laughs> No comment. <laughs> he didn't buy me any airway stuff this year. It was, it, it was really, it was horrible. I had to go to the hospital. Because we did buy lots of airway stuff in the past. That's why. <laughs> I only have like 14 scopes. I think you got to do better than that. And we had to buy other stuff this year, which actually transitions really well into the next thing we're going to talk about. So Kathleen Kerrigan is one of our assistant program directors and also our simulation director. And she's gonna tell you a little bit about some sim things that are going on. Hi there. So we do sim every Wednesday on our academic day. Um, we do it in two different ways. We do it in the sim lab and then we do it in situ. And I just wanna show you some pictures from actually our sim that we did today. So here we go. So this was literally this morning with our third year residents in the trauma bay. Um, we had an in situ simulation and you can see we have um, our nurses doing CPR on our mannequin. We've got uh, just the title slide, Kathleen. Oh, it didn't, it didn't advance. I think it might've froze, there we go. Do you wanna hit play? Might I'm gonna hit play, see what happens. Did it change? Nope. Okay, that's a problem. <laughs> Let's try this again. How's that? Any better? Nope. Nope. All right, can you see it if I just do that? Yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so this is literally this morning. We have two of our third year residents, some of our nurses doing CPR on a mannequin and things got a little bit exciting and the mannequin required a procedure um, and it's year-based. So this is our third years. We wouldn't throw our first years into this case. Our first years will do more 
appropriate level things, but they'll do it with the same team. Um, we do it interdisciplinary. So we have nursing and pharmacy with our providers. So in the background here, you can see our pharmacy residents, our residents and our nursing staff. And when you know, something had to happen to this patient this morning. So this was a pregnant patient who came in and became unresponsive. She lost pulses and they're performing a resuscitative hysterotomy. So the nurses are still doing CPR, pharmacy trying to figure out what's going on. Just had to take off her glasses. So we can zoom up close, courtesy of Ben Osborne, our photographer. And they're inside, they found the uterus, they're gonna open it up. So they're in, they find the baby. Deliver the baby with maybe a little bit of excessive force because the head fell off. Okay, anyway, so that's what happened today. <laughs> but most of it was good fun. Um, we also do regular traditional simulation in the sim lab, but it's a little bit less fun. And that's all I have. <laughs> That is a known complication that the head falls off, right, Kathleen? Decapitation, yes, definitely. <laughs> and then I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to share a little bit about some of the other things we're doing. So we're in addition to sort of the traditional simulation and uh, in situ, like that amazing case. We also do a lot of procedure training. We've had to do a ton of it this year because we're not allowed to spend time around each other for hands-on as much. So we're doing more one-to-one -one things, lots of mannequin training. Um, and then the big sort of new thing that's coming is uh, Ryan Clark couldn't join us. He's one of our former med ed fellows. He's uh, recently joined the academic faculty and he's launching this kind of revision of our orthopedic curriculum based on a uh, desire by our grads to get sort of more hands-on training with like the less exciting ortho stuff. We put shoulders and hips back in. We weren't doing as good a job of the more minor ortho things and really taking care of it ourselves. And so he's expanding a whole curriculum. We've bought some additional trainers. We've got a whole college reduction trainer that you guys will get to come play with if you come hang out with us for a few years, but lots of stuff like that. And the goal is to respond to needs that the residents have, needs that the graduates identify, and add more things to the curriculum that way. All right, I do wanna ask uh, CN the question you entered in the chat, but I think it's really important about airway boot camp and orientation, because I know it's gotta be really scary for people going into residency, like you know all the stuff you talked about, how are you gonna get introduced to all of those many, many things? So the, what we do uh, during orientation, the biggest part is we do do an airway workshop uh, with the incoming first year class, we go over DL, we go over VL, we do sub superglottic airways, and we do front of neck airways. And the residents come in and help to teach that for you. So it also gives you some extra time with the classes above you because they are going to be there with you on your airways, which is really wonderful. And we have didactics throughout orientation, especially focusing on a really ordered approach. And again, I do those as airway tape reviews that which we call ATRs, um, where we just go through a whole bunch of airways and focus in on what makes people more successful in their airways early on. And the biggest thing that made me more successful and one of the reasons I sort of fell in love with airway was figuring out that even though I had gotten pretty good at airway, was that what I didn't have was a really, really clean stepwise approach. And once I learned a really clean stepwise approach, like airway became like so much better for me. And so that's what I try to pass along to everyone. Thank you, CN. All right, next up, so we keep moving. Uh, Caitlin Farrell is gonna talk to us. She's one of our second year residents and she's gonna talk to us about some of our social EM initiatives. Hi everybody, I'm Caitlin. I'm uh, calling in from the beautiful PICU call room. 
Um, I had sim this afternoon, but it was not nearly as exciting as uh, the video. I thought at first you were going to show a video of us, and I was like, it wasn't that exciting, but third years definitely had a, a better time. Um, so I'm going to talk to you all about uh, social EM at Bay State. Um, please feel free to chime in with any questions or comments. Um, social EM is definitely a rising uh, field in popularity, um, and it's definitely growing at Bay State um, very rapidly. So when I think of social EM and health policy in general, um, obviously extremely broad topics um, and individual interests in social EM and health policy can be multifaceted. Um, and I really think that our approach to social EM at Bay State is multifaceted as well. Um, so there are different ways that you can get involved with social EM here, um, mostly research, education, outreach, and advocacy. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about e each of those aspects. Um, so first of all, research. We have excellent research faculty here at Bay State. Um, by no means do you have to get involved with research um, if you come here, but if it's something that you're interested in, um, there are multiple opportunities. Um, Elizabeth Schoenfeld, who is on this call, um, is one of our great research uh, faculty members and does a lot of work within social EM. Um, we've done a couple of studies together um, and Bill Soares, who is on this call as well, I'm sure he will talk about um, some of our research and work um, in opioid use disorder. So that's one thing um, that you can definitely get involved in in terms of social EM. The second is education. Um, and I think since my intern year to this year, this is the biggest growth that I've seen at Bay State. Um, we have really started incorporating um, discussions of social determinants of health, um, racism in uh, medicine, health outcomes among different populations throughout our entire didactic curriculum. Um, typically, we were talking about these sorts of topics at War Club a lot, which is what um, Zach and Rachel were talking about earlier. But over the past year, I think there's been a real push towards um, incorporating all of these discussions throughout um, multiple different didactic conversations, whether we're talking about different disease presentations in populations, um, how different um, populations are affected by um, various things. Um, there's been a really big push for that. Additionally, um, Elizabeth, again, is involved in the SAM um, consensus conference this year, which is a special conference on um, social EM um, and how we advance social EM. Um, so education really happens not only during our didactics, but with our individual faculty members as well, um, both on shift and off shift. Um, outreach, I think, is something that we are also um, really expanding here. I was just on elective my last month. Um, and what I did for my elective is um, basically did a uh, community needs assessment because we are trying to start a uh, outreach van. The details of this are still coming together, obviously. Um, but this is something that we uh, are having a ton of support from the administration from. Um, and it's being received extremely well. Um, so we're hoping to partner with different organizations throughout the community. And this really arose uh, from resident interest in wanting to sort of bridge that gap with our patients, seeing patients in the emergency department, some of which are frequent flyers, some of which we know have issues of housing insecurity, substance use disorder, um, difficulty um, accessing the medical care system. Um, we as a residency really wanted to do more to try to bridge that gap. Um, and this is one of the solutions that we are coming up with. And I really think it's gonna be amazing and wonderful. Um, and the last aspect of social EM that I'll talk about briefly is advocacy. Um, you know, I think as a residency, we have um, different aspects of advocacy that have happened. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the um, Vote ER, um, organization that happened um, earlier this year was put out um, by a few docs at MGH, which basically helped to register patients to vote in the emergency department. Um, we had a lot of providers get involved with that. Um, 
I can say on a personal level, um, I'm involved in a lot of organized medicine, um, writing health policy um, for the AMA and the Massachusetts Medical Society. And the best part about Bay State, I think, is the support that you will get from the administration. Um, and this is not just in terms of social EM, but in terms of any interest that you have. So as I've always said to anyone that I interviewed with uh, this year or um, spoke to previous years at when we could go to bars, um, you know, the administration here wants you to be successful and wants you to be happy in whatever makes you happy in emergency medicine. Um, and I really think that that's true. And I've seen that with support for me in health policy um, and advocacy, so. Thank you, Caitlin. I'm gonna bring uh, Bill Soares in as well. Bill? I'm bigger on my screen. Hi, everybody. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about a very specific uh, area that you've been working on, which is harm reduction in the ED? Or anything else you want to tell us about, really? We're happy yeah. to listen. Avalon, the kids, I think, are asleep, so we should be okay for the five minutes that I'm off of mute. Um, wow, that's my face is really big right now. Um, so, hi, everybody. My name is Bill. Um, and, you know, as Caitlin mentioned, I, I want to talk a little bit about addiction medicine and, and what we've done in harm reduction. Um, for those who don't yet realize, addiction medicine really is an essential part of your training, or at least should be an essential part of your training. Wherever you go, wherever you practice in this country or probably out of this country, you will encounter addiction. And I think for a long time, up until, you know, when I was a resident, um, we kind of ignored that right? We, we treated the immediate problem and then we sent people on their way. This, this wasn't our field. Um, and it turns out that is probably the farthest thing from the truth. So you should, in, in any program you look at, you should ask yourself, what training am I getting? And what is that philosophy? Because these are patients that you are going to encounter. And if you don't have an understanding and a way to work with patients, it's going to make your life really frustrating and it's going to hurt your patients as well. So, you know, we can talk about buprenorphine, which we've been doing for, I don't know, three years now. Um, but, you know, it's also thanks to um, some amazing faculty and, and really the openness, I think, of our group and some amazing co-researchers that, that we get to kind of be on the cutting edge with some stuff um, to teach you. So when we approach patients it's trying to go beyond just, hey, do you want medicine? Hey, do you want Suboxone? No, okay, goodbye. Um, and trying to get to the fact of, of what's going on with this person. And, and if they're not ready for treatment, what can I do to help them? And that's where harm reduction comes in. That idea of, instead of me telling you where you should be, um, assessing where you are and working with you where you are. Um, so at its very basic things like naloxone, but moving on from that, we for the past year have been um, giving out harm reduction kits where we actually have safe use supplies and instructions for patients who are still using um, drugs, whether it's intravenously or otherwise, to try to say, hey, we respect your decision that you're not ready for treatment right now. We also don't want you to die. And let us show you how you stay safe, how you don't get a massive infection, how you don't overdose again. Um, and so that's something that we've already been doing. And, and we have actually been talking to other institutions about how they can implement that. Coming down the line though, let's keep pushing. So hopefully soon we will have approval um, for actually syringes. Um, we have approval for post-overdose telehealth to actually talk to people after they come into the emergency department um, and assess their willingness for treatment when they are not stuck in a loud hallway bed um, with Narcan kind of weaning off of their system. Um, we also um, are in preliminary talks with some of our methadone clinics to start to think about, can we induce methadone from the emergency department? There are only three treatments for opioid use disorder. 
One of them we really can't give. I'm not going to give someone a shot of long acting naltrexone in the emergency department. That's going to make everybody's life harder. Um, one we can, and that has gained popularity, but the best studied medication methadone, we still can't, and there's still a lot of stigma around that. So can we actually increase our armamentarium to two drugs um, and effectively treat people who maybe would prefer methadone for different reasons and get around some of those barriers? Um, and so there's there's really a lot going on. And you know, the goal hopefully for you, again, it's not to say that you're gonna go into addiction medicine. It's not gonna say that you're you can always do research. We love if you do research, but uh, just as Caitlin said, um, we're not gonna push that on you. But hopefully we can train you in a way to approach patients that is both beneficial to patients themselves, but also enhances your practice. Meaning that you don't dread going into that room on someone that overdosed, that you know how to approach them no matter what position they're in and you can offer them help. So that's kind of the goal. And I think we're, we're doing a lot of things that, that really are, that other places aren't doing it. And it's really thanks to the openness and willingness of the staff um, and the administration that we're able to do that. So yeah, that's what I got. Bill, one question, uh, or a couple of questions coming in um, from the chat. So uh, one was, uh, are all the residents involved in the post-overdose telehealth addiction medicine, or is it more voluntary? What's the status of this? Oh, that status is it's so cutting edge that we will get there. Um, so interestingly, so there have been very few benefits of COVID, but one of the benefits has been a loosening of restrictions um, along the lines of telehealth and addiction medicine. So being able to have a telehealth visit to actually induce Suboxone, um, that was not legal as of six months ago. And now because of COVID, um, we can now do that. So there will, we have a pilot grant from Bay State hopefully in the spring, summer to um, look at this, what we're calling enhanced harm reduction, which includes additional supplies, but also includes that next day telehealth follow-up. Interestingly, from a perspective of how does this function in a system and how is this sustainable, residents will likely be able to participate, but thinking about sustainability, residents cannot bill for um, telehealth. So if we're thinking about, you know, I think we will have folks and, and have that be an experience, um, but also keeping in mind that we want to make this something that every community can do. We want to look at, is there the ability for it to be self-sustaining um, through that way? So, so yeah, by the time you're here, we should have an answer to that question. And then just one other question that uh, came in from Richie in the chat as well. Um, something he'd noticed, which was the stigma of using one drug to get off another drug, something that I think a lot of us have seen. And do, have you found the sort of the approach that we're taking to be helpful with kind of helping people handle that, be willing to kind of try buprenorphine? Um, yeah, so that, that still is a large stigma. And, and honestly, we, um, it is definitely something I, um, to think about in, in, terms framing of racial um, equity, because we see that um, more specifically, we have seen that in our Hispanic population, this idea of I, I don't want to be on anything. Um, our Suboxone protocol is very low barrier. You have to have opioid use disorder and you have to be interested in Suboxone. And, and those are the only two things that you need to walk out with a Suboxone prescription, basically. Um, but there is still a lot of stigma and stigma in the community um, around medication. So that is an ongoing battle that we hope by having more open discussions with people um, we'll be able to confront. But but it is, I think everywhere, that's still a, a big stigma um, that gets perpetuated. Bill, how about uh, safe injection sites in Springfield? Oh, man. Um, so technically by federal law, safe consumption sites are still illegal. Um, there was a court case in Philadelphia that I forget the status of there it, at Berkeley, there was actually an impressive uh, publication in the New England Journal um, about an underground uh, safe consumption site that went under the radar. Long and short, technically they are not legal. And so if they are operating, um, 
there aren't many licensed providers who are kind of willing to admit that. Um, there is a post-injection um, kind of watch site that Healthcare for the Homeless in Boston runs, um, which is an interesting concept. The hard part though about Springfield and about your community that you would come into is that we don't have the transportation infrastructure that Boston has. So to place um, a safe consumption site or a post safe watch site in one place would be pretty difficult to capture a whole bunch of the population. So, um, so yeah, that is something that would be more from a kind of federal level. Yeah, Springfield actually covers a fairly large like square mile footprint, but it's very dispersed. So about 300,000 people, but in a space much larger than I think much larger than actually Boston is, which is, I mean, which is tiny. Um, another question, uh, resources for long-term that we can refer people to for sort of long-term follow-up care, community resources, which I think we have both Bay State ones as well as lots of other ones that we can get people out to like Clean Slate. Yeah, so, I mean, we have our kind of traditional resources for medication treatment, but we work, we also work heavily with Tapestry, which is our um, uh, syringe access program and harm reduction program. Um, they do a lot of different things. Um, they do obviously the basic harm reduction, they do medication treatments, they do um, women's health, um, and they are starting a, a mobile unit, including a, a mobile Suboxone unit. So that is a heavy player. They, are, um, they have offices around most of our hospitals and we work closely. In fact, they come in um, and lecture. They lectured the interns last year and taught them about injecting and how people actually inject and what are some of the dangers of that. So, um, and I see the last question, do all residents have MAT waivers? So as a resident, because you have a limited DEAX, um, you can't technically have the waiver itself. You can do the training. And then when you are done and you pay your, pay your money to have the full DEA, you can um, transition and get the waiver. Hopefully by the time that happens, there will be no waiver, but um, we will see. A waiver for the waiver for the waiver. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, and, I, and Bill's not going anywhere. We'll have a chance for sort of more questions as well. I'm going to bring on the next speaker. Uh, Vanna Albert, one of our faculty, is going to talk to us about uh, what we're doing in terms of diversity and equity. All right. Hey, everyone. Thank you all for staying on as long as you've been, <laughs> I guess it's been all 40 minutes. Anyway, so I won't spend too much time, but uh, we did, we started like a diversity and equity division, which kind of rose out of everything going on with the pandemic and the social justice movement. And I think in general, just the, you know, just the want or the desire really to try to diversify, you know, the, you know, basically the providers so that it can better match the patients that we serve. And so one of the things that we actually started working on is myself and uh, Nadia Villarreal, who's also one of the faculty, um, we're working on actually creating a health equity fellowship. And so that fellowship will probably going to be starting to recruit actually this summer. And so our goal is to have anyone who's interested in health equity to be able to come and kind of get um, some training in just, just basic topics and disparities in medicine, whether or not it includes race, sex, gender, and then climate change and our goal is to have that fellow also be able to choose one particular area that they'd like to focus on and are and either create and probably create both a research project and like a community advocacy project so a lot of the stuff that we want to accomplish with the fellowship will be things that they can collaborate with with other people in the department so if you want to do things collaborate with social em collaborate with research because i feel like all these topics kind of all kind of co-mingle with with one another so that hopefully will be able to go live this this particular summer slash spring for us to start recruiting. Uh, the other things that we're currently working on right now is we also, we're also working with um, our medical student clerkship director with Lisa so that we can create a clerkship focused specifically for underrepresented students. So the goal is to have people who are students that are interested in EM rising, uh, essentially people at the end of their third year rising fourth years who are interested and also underrepresented to be able to have them to come and still do the clerkship as they normally would. But the goal is to provide additional support, whether or not it's an additional stipend, and then to also give one-on-one -on -one workshops so that we can help them with whatever areas that they need to work on, whether it's CVs, whether or not it's just making themselves a more competitive applicant because um, we realize that a lot of times 
students that are underrepresented often don't have the right mentorship and we want to be able to provide that and also encourage people to come here and see that you know we're great <laughs> and <laughs> the, other, the other part of it is uh, we're also trying to increase uh, work with some high schools. So this is still preliminary. We haven't established anything, but we wanna start working with uh, charter schools in the area to try to create a pipeline program to see if we can try to encourage people, even in the local area, to be interested in medicine and help bridge the gap that we're already seeing. Um, otherwise, we're trying to, um, the hospital in itself is pretty invested in diversity and equity. So there are a lot of people from different, different fields, whether it's medicine, OBGYN, who are all working together in like a multidisciplinary committee for us to address disparities in general. So that's something that we actually just started doing monthly meetings for. And so I think that will be promising. Dana, thank you. That was a great summary of a lot of things that are going on. Um, and you're able to stick around for questions too as we get close. We're only a couple more folks, uh, speakers, and then we're gonna have some time for Q&A as well. Um, all right, so one more, I'm gonna bring in uh, Lauren Westerfer. Um, she is one of our research faculty and our uh, fellowship director for the research fellowship. All right, y'all. Um, hi, uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about research at Bay State. Uh, but don't worry, what I'm not going to do is talk about all the bench we research we do because we save that for the children, um, like my own, they were learning how to pipette at young ages. Um, we don't do a whole ton of uh, bench type research at Bay State. What we do a lot of is sort of clinically focused research. So for example, uh, Dr. Soares uh, is focusing his research on opioid use disorder and addiction medicine. And he's got a couple projects ongoing about you know, how, to, how to help start patients on buprenorphine, how to increase uh, clinician prescribing, but also uh, pilot projects on harm reduction. So there's, there's a lot of stuff here going on. And a lot of us are, uh, are sort of collaborating on this um, together and, and looking at different kind of aspects to this problem. Uh, renal colic is also uh, something that that uh, Dr. Schoenfeld is focusing on, um, and basically, you know, the battle of the CT scanner versus the ultrasound, which sort of leads into shared decision making. So she has uh, right now a, a trial ongoing um, doing this, but it, it just shows that some of the research that we do, it's not only clinical, so like renal colic, but also focused on how we practice actual medicine, so like shared decision making, which is something that's not just important in renal colic, but in all kinds of other things, whether it's acute coronary syndrome or outpatient management of pulmonary embolism or syncope, or even the decision to whether to start buprenorphine. Um, we also do some PE related research. Uh, my residents don't hear a whole lot about pulmonary embolism, um, but we you know, uh, are looking at a, a couple of things related to pulmonary embolism, uh, diagnostic testing, as well as outpatient management of PE. And predominantly here, um, focusing on what's called implementation science, which is sort of, there's this gap between when clinicians uh, kind of, when the evidence says, okay, this is what we should do. And then the the 10 years, 12 years, 15 years that it takes for clinicians, you know, to actually do that um, at the community level, at the academic level, sort of at all the levels where patients seek care um, in the emergency setting. So that's implementation science. And so that's not just like my work with pulmonary embolism, but also even with regards to medication for opioid use disorder, or even getting clinicians to not scan every single kidney stone that comes in. Um, there's also uh, research being done on the heart core and acute coronary syndrome and other sort of cardiovascular and resuscitation type of research and um, on out of hospital cardiac arrest as well. A lot of this focuses on using sort of leveraging large data sets um, and sort of in, looking at those and looking at the data there to try to figure out who benefits from targeted temperature management or other things. Is there like a prognostic score? But you may be saying, look, I'm not, I'm not really that interested in research. And while it's our hope and desire that all of you will become 
intense researchers, uh, we do recognize that not everyone has that goal, um, and especially in residency when you're trying to focus on becoming a good doctor. So the other part of our focus at research at Bay State is not just to crank out papers and get grants and change, you know, use our science for good, but also to try to teach our residents how to read. Um, some of them are working on Good Night Moon, others um, actually are working on uh, the literature and really learning to read the research because it's really easy to sort of read the abstract, it's much harder to understand the research and really critically appraise it. So we have a couple different things we do here. We have a lecture series called Stats Are Fun, um, where we go through all of the formulas. Just kidding, we don't do that. Um, what we do is we try to do a combination of entertaining as well as uh, integration of popular articles or current articles or um, articles that maybe highlight pet peeves in the emergency department and bring up statistical concepts and try to introduce them and go through them in a way where uh, our residents can read the studies, maybe read about a concept in a study and really understand it um, without just sort of skimming uh, the abstract and conclusions to a study. So for example, this is from a talk on non-inferiority uh, studies, which are sort of increasingly popular, just demonstrating how we can kind of go through and teach these concepts without really getting, um, you know, into that nitty gritty, which Dr. Soares loves, but me personally, not a huge fan of, um, but just trying to make it a little more accessible for people who, who may not want to go and get a master's or a PhD. Uh, we also have uh, sort of these uh, talks in our curriculum. Um, so we do a lot of the, the focus stats topics and then we integrate them and sort of apply them going through articles. So we recently went through one on uh, Bamaliza who's a Mab, um, just kidding, that's not how you say it, um, and, and kind of going through the articles and talking about different statistical and methodologic issues that came up in it, whether it's looking at the flow diagrams, whether it's looking at two studies together, whether it's really looking at multiple testing or composite outcomes um, and multiple comparisons, kind of getting people to remember those concepts and taking advantage of space repetition. Um, and also how to like interpret common figures. The last part is we want our, our clinicians to also be up to date. So we also deliver sort of spoon fed literature updates that sort of say, all right, here's the bottom line of this study. Um, so the, those are some of the, the highlights as to what we are doing um, at research, not only our own research, but also trying to promote uh, consumption of the research um, at, at Bay State. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was a great review of all kinds of good educational content that we do. All right, last up, I wanna bring our chiefs in. We've got a couple of our chiefs here because that's who you really wanted to hear from was the residents telling you about what life is like after Bay State and what this can be a, a springboard for you. So Kristen and Ophelia are here to talk to you as well. Hey guys, I'm Kristen. I'm one of four chiefs and Ophelia is here with me. Hi guys. Um, so um, we wanted to talk to you about what it often looks like after Bay State and how easy it is to find a job that brings you joy um, and something that you'll find talking to many of the Bay State grads um, is that they were able to select where they were going, um, which is uh, really a privilege that comes from Bay State. Um, in particular, a lot of our grads um, proportionally choose to do fellowships um, when you compare like nationally the stats for it. I'm sure Ben can do a better job with an exact breakdown, but more often than not, our residents will choose to do a fellowship. Um, there are many really great fellowships within Bay State uh, that our residents um, are well prepared for and often will choose to stay because they love Bay State. Uh, but to brag on one of our uh, upcoming grads. Uh, Matt Shapiro is leaving us to do a fellowship at Yale for EMS next year. Um, one of our chiefs is doing a fellowship in palliative care in Pennsylvania, which we're super excited for. Um, and these are opportunities that they had, they felt like they had options for really competitive places to go to fellowship, which is really very cool. Um, so that, that's one thing. And I'm the oddball here because I'm in the Air Force. So I have no control where I'm going, but um, so I don't have any personal exciting story to share with you, but it's really neat to see my peers go off and do incredible things, so. 
and then you're going to come back into a fellowship in four years. Yeah, honestly, honestly, quite possibly. And Ophelia it's, too. It's a, a kind of a, an addiction in the sense that the community is so strong, it just like lures you in. Um, and after this, if you guys want to ask me how I ended up ranking Bay State um, after many hours of going back and forth, because it was not my husband's and my initial plan, and we absolutely ranked this place, um, and I have no regrets, like ask me and I'll share with you why. Um, so the other piece of the puzzle, I guess, kind of half and half every year do fellowship and the other half go out to work in the community. Um, and we have a really great group of people all over the nation. You can just say, I want to go to, I don't know, whatever city. And you ask your attendings, hey, do you know how I can get a job in I don't know, Miami? And they'll say, oh, so-and-so from class of whatever is in Miami. I'm going to connect you with that person. So we have a really tight-knit community and we really help each other out. This year has been a little bit different with covid but I think like even then a lot of our attendings have really like pushed to help us and recently uh, past grads have also like tried to reach out and to do whatever they could to help us out. Um, so that's been really lovely. So I think like Kristen said, where people know Bay State, people know that we have a lot of acuity and you saw just by everyone speaking that a lot of our attendings are very passionate of what they do. And you guys will get great training wherever you go, but we're very partial to this team and we're very happy. And Kristen and I may very well come back even though we're not doing a fellowship here because we love it. So good luck and hope you, to see you guys next year. All right, thank you both so much. All right, so that's all we had in terms of uh, people we've planned to kind of tell you about their, uh, what they've been up to. So what we'd like to do now is we want to respect your time. If you need to go, because it's almost an hour, that is totally okay. Like Ben said in the email, this is all for you. This is not meant to be, you know, this is not a special test. You know, uh, Ben already submitted his rank list. This is really about getting you as much information as you need to decide what to do with us. And if this is what you want to do, where you want to hang out for uh, three plus years. So we're happy to stay as many of us as can and answer some questions, whatever you guys want to know. And if you need to go, that's okay too. This is where I should have had a plant in the audience to ask a question because that awkward silence is brutal. I think this place sounds really awesome. Can I do residency again? <laughs> yes, yes, you can. Which would you like to do this time? I, I don't know. I'm gonna, I don't know. There's so many new tracks. Lauren, what's a PE? I can turn this into a PE lecture. Don't tempt me. I think all of us can say that we really appreciate your guys' PowerPoints. Those slides are money. I mean, obviously very Star Wars oriented, but that's, that is appreciated by all of us. <laughs> also, Kristen, thank you for your service. That's badass. I've done nothing yet, so you can't thank me yet, but you're welcome. And I, you know, Talk to me in four years and we'll see if it was a good good decision or not. Hopefully, hopefully good. All right, well, it seems like most folks have had their questions answered or just don't want to shout it into the internet uh, tonight, which I told you that. Oh, um, all right, go for it. <laughs> it's not about the curriculum or anything that was talked about, just out of curiosity. Um, what neighborhoods are do most people live in or neighborhoods that people like? Um, just have some free time and want to go on Zillow and like troll the area. Kristen, Ophelia, you want to handle this one? So I think most of us live in Northampton just because there's a quaint little downtown and a lot of coffee shops and you have hiking trails nearby. Um, most of my class lives here. It's too expensive to buy. So a lot of people have bought either in East Hampton and Kristen can talk about this in Connecticut, um, but if you're young, single, or just want to be close to the bars, the restaurants, I would say probably Northampton. I am neither of those things. Okay, so then Chicopee, East Longmeadow, and Fields might be better. Yeah, my husband and I wanted to buy a place, so we have this condo in Enfield um, that comes with the disclosure that we do not have children, and 
if you have kids that you're trying to get in a school system, like that's, I think a separate conversation and Enfield is not the place that you want to be. Um, but we were able to buy a place and I am most definitely an introvert where I need my heated blanket, which is like right here and my two cats, um, and my like evening glass of wine. And I'm like totally happy as a clam. Um, and so for me, this is exactly what I need. My commute is 15 minutes. Um, uh, our co-chief Ashley lives with her wife, um, in Wilbraham on this like beautiful, like, I don't know how much land they have. I'm going to say an acre. It's probably not an acre. I've been in cities my whole life. It seems like a large plot of land with chickens and dogs and cats. Um, and her commute is like 25, 30 minutes. Um, Adam, I don't think she's far from where you are. It's like 25 minutes about the commute from where you're at. 17 minutes at two in the morning. 45 if there are school buses out there because it's a kind of right across Springfield. But what's really nice about this area is there are a ton of towns, almost anything you want. You can live on a farm and people absolutely have. You can live downtown in Springfield in a converted old factory building with cool high ceilings and all that kind of stuff and walking distance to the casino. So if that's what you're into, you can do that. You can live in the cute college town area, which a lot of people want to live in. Like there's, and you, it's cost of living here is affordable enough that on a resident salary, you can buy a reasonable starter home. We don't really recommend it for people only going to be here for three years, but a lot of people are going to be here longer. So that's okay too. Uh, we promise to give you all the assistance you would need figuring that out uh, if we're fortunate enough to match you in March. Awesome. Thank you guys. All right, looks like uh, Elizabeth answered the last question in the chat. Um, and so I think probably time to call it a night. Ben, do you have any final thoughts? Just want to wave at everybody. Good luck with the match. This is, I know it's uh, it's unsettling time for you all and it's, but it's, it's, uh, it's going to be okay. And uh, I look forward to seeing, I can't see all 38 of you in a, in a couple of weeks, but uh, I'm sure some of us will cross paths again, no matter what's happening. So good luck to everybody.